Good evening, uh, folks. It is 6.02, and we are gathered here this evening to do the work of sacred organizing in the Clackamas Land and Housing Cohort. Um, my name is Pastor Sarah Gross Samuelson. I use she, her pronouns. And tonight, um, I was just thinking about this because the design team members have begun the practice of sharing their why um, when we facilitate, just because um, it's, it's a good question for us all to ground ourselves in. Um, and to share in conversation with others in one-to-ones, in, in um, research meetings, etc. Uh, tonight, my why is feeling um, is feeling more on the sacred organizing work than on the land and housing part of our work. I, my why is that I organize because it is the way, the only way that I can see to practice my faith these days, out loud in this world. Um, this deep listening this deep unveiling, this deep action, um, and this sacred pause that we participate in together. Um, tonight, um, we are going to be um, digging into house meetings um, and learning a little bit more about them. They sit in the um, sacred organizing spiral, kind of on the threshold between um, sacred encounter or listening and um, sacred unveiling, where we start to like kind of discern um, and collect together stories. Um, so, um, so that's still kind of where we are and, um, and are sitting in with. Um, if before we get into, before we get into it, um, before we dig in, um, if you could take a minute and just also um, change your name if you haven't already. I mean, not like literally change your name. Um, I've been reading a lot of Old Testament stories to my toddler um, in his story Bible, like the one where all their names get changed. It's really confusing for him. Um, if you could change your Zoom name to include the community that you are organizing with, um, so KOK for King of Kings, OGUMC for Oak Grove, MLC for Milwaukee Lutheran, um, just so that we know um, where you where you are rooting your work, um, that would be fantastic. And if you um, don't know how to do that, you can hover your your oh, what's the little the clicker. You shouldn't ask me to do this part ever. I'm really bad at the technical part. <laughs> Remember when I had to do it in Spanish? Um, <laughs> over the little three ellipses, the, the little dot, 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 and it, it should come with a drop down menu and then you can click rename and just type in just the uh, uh, abbreviation for your community name at the end of your name. That would be super helpful. It's the it's clicker, it's the clicker, the cursor, um, the clapper. It's Remember it's the it's clapper? <laughs> So, um, all right, there we go. Um, welcome, and um, I don't, I don't remember who I'm handing it off to. So somebody better shut me up real quick. Hi, Story, quick, take it away. away. <laughs> I'm Story. I'm here with Storyline and Oak Grove United Methodist Church, doing work in both communities. My why is that I came to this realization once that I um, would fall into a category that would be considered rent burdened. But with that came the realization that I would never be without a home because so many people are, are in my corner and love me. And I wanted to be a part of a group that wanted to address that at a systemic level, to be the person on a systemic level that is in everyone's corner because everyone deserves that. And so that's my why for why I'm here. And I want to invite you now into just a space of grounding and awareness. During this time, for this first bit, you can close your eyes, you can turn off your camera if you want, whatever you're comfortable with, um, as I invite you into a space of awareness. <sighs> awareness of your body, of the inner workings of your cells, of the opening and closing of your lungs when you breathe, the bones and muscles that brought you into this space today. Maybe some with more pains and aches than others, more pains and aches than maybe you had even a year ago. Um, but no matter how easily or hard your body did the work today, we want to call awareness to it, to honor it, and to connect with it. Take a few moments to check in with your body, your first home, the one you live in from the day you are born until your last day on earth. 
Notice the way you're holding your jaw. You can touch it if you want even. Is it tense? Unfurl your brow. Sometimes I like to do it with my own thumb. <laughs> Drop your shoulders if they're too high. Roll your neck out if you need to. You can stretch into the air and sideways. Unfurl your fingers, roll out your wrists. Come home for a few minutes to your body. And as you do the sacred work of listening to your body, you might unveil some truths about it, about its pressures, about its needs, its stresses. So you can begin to know where healing and attention need to be paid. You may even find yourself realizing that, hey, this headache that I have, maybe it's from a pinch in my shoulders or the way I'm sitting. Maybe the stomach ache you have is from anxiety or worry. Maybe your, your nose is running because you have old contacts in. This unveiling invites you into a deeper understanding of the interconnectedness of all things, both inside of you and outside of you. In my Christian tradition, there is this image of the body of Christ that speaks to the interconnectedness of the community of God. And whether you exist in that tradition or not, I think this image is a beautiful picture of shared power, shared strength, and shared weakness, of the way we're supposed to exist in relationship to our bodies, to our communities, and to our neighbors, even to the universe. Each part of your body has a vested interest in keeping the rest of it whole and safe. And think of how a disconnect in your body can disconnect you from the real source of your pain. And when we are connected to our bodies, we have a deeper understanding of what it needs to do its job. Now expand that outward. Expand that same idea of how you are connected to your body, to how you're connected to your roommates, your pets, to your neighbors, to those you share the road with when you're driving. We're not isolated from them. Their hurt is our hurt and care for our neighbor is care for ourselves. And guess what friends, as you ground in that truth, you'll find many of you are already doing that. And that came up to be in a lovely conversation that I had with Juliana this week about um, just, we were checking in with each other. We started talking about one-to-ones and I asked her what she found most compelling about that time spent in one-to-ones in that intentional connection with another person. Juliana, would you mind sharing just a little bit about what you told me? Thank you, Story. Um, so my name is Juliana and I uh, work with Storyline. Um, what I find most compelling, so when I went into this work, I was really nervous about meeting new people because um, it's something that I, I guess, try to avoid sometimes because of how nervous I get and things like that. But one-to-ones have shown me how wonderful, like a simple conversation can open a world through someone else's voice. Um, each response leads to like just different experiences and it all connects like a puzzle and it just creates a connection that I feel like other conversations wouldn't create um it really feels like a heart it's a heartwarming experience to just be able to talk to another person and have them be comfortable enough to talk about like their life's experiences and things like that so yeah thank you Juliana I really appreciate it I love the way you said that how it all those pieces connected to like give you the that picture of that person that that idea of interconnectedness just expands. And thank you. I, when you said it, I wrote it down because I thought it was so beautiful. So thank you for sharing um, with the group. And I'm going to do um, now shift into our land acknowledgement. So I'm gonna share my screen once more. Okay. We are grounded in this land. We gather together on holy living land, earth 
which supports and sustains us. We acknowledge that this region is the ancestral and unceded territory of the original peoples of the Multnomah, Waskow, Clackamas, Kathlamet, Cowlitz, Willamette Tumwater, and Cascades bands of the Chinookan peoples, the Tualatin band of the Kalapua, and many other tribes who made their homes along the Columbia and Willamette River. They lived and thrived in profound and complex and interdependent relationship with the land and other beings long before white colonial settlement. We recognize we are here because of systemic policies of genocide, relocation, and assimilation that was forced upon them. Today, we acknowledge the region's diverse, vibrant native communities who are still connected to this land. Indigenous peoples, 70,000 strong, with more than 280 tribes, with at least 18 unique languages, both local and distant. We extend our deepest gratitude to you and your elders, past and present, who have stewarded this land and who carry on tribal traditions for present and future generations. Thank you, Story and Juliana, uh, for that grounding. Um, that is really a perfect intro into our one-to-one -to -one together. Um, I am Anna Hosley, uh, Storyline Community and co-lead uh, organizer of Land and Housing. Um, and we are gonna spend about 12 minutes in a one-to-one -to -one today to talk about some of what Story and Juliana just referred to. So sharing a time that you felt that interconnection in community, that you felt really um, connected to others and maybe how you became connected and sharing a, about a time, if, if you are willing to share, um, that you felt more isolated from community and how those spaces felt different to you. Um, so we will, Story, can you give us, let's see, um, 11 minutes for the one-to-one? -one. 12, no, 12 minutes. Yep. And away we go. Lovely to see you all again. I really enjoy that um, the energy before the one-to-ones is often like, okay, we're acclimating to this space in maybe like an <laughs> academic way. And then the one-to-ones come back and you all have big smiles, <laughs> yeah. different energy. And that's really, really lovely. Um, all right. I am going to uh, talk to you about house meetings, which is the topic of our evening. Um, and it, first, I'm just going to talk to you a little bit about uh, sort of the purpose of house meetings, why we even talk about it. Um, so at this point in the process, many of us have done a lot of one-to-ones. We've listened to people individually. And remember, in one-to-ones, just like we just had, we are listening for self-interest, which means really we're just listening to what matters to that person. We've listened to the pressures that are facing them or the people they love. Uh, we've listened to their curiosities, their hopes, their anxieties about the future maybe. And we've heard their story. But if we stop there at that one-to-one -one place, we just have individual stories. If we stop there, we are just a collection of people almost under the illusion that we have nothing really to do with each other. If we understand each other just as individuals. Um, that would be understanding a community of, of individuals, not like a dynamic interconnected body that, that Story talked about, um, but more like, like a bucket of body parts, <laughs> just a really rich kind of horrific image for you. <laughs> um, uh, I experienced this um, when I had sciatica recently, um, a sciatica injury in my lower back. And because of that, I couldn't move my toe. Um, so the, the pressure impacting my back was impacting my foot too, because I'm not a bucket of body parts, I am a body. Um, but until I recognized how those pressures were connected, how my toe and my lower back were con connected to each other, I was focusing on the wrong thing. So I couldn't heal my toe until I, I began to look for and understand how my whole body was interconnected. 
Similarly, when we talk about house meetings, we're getting to this point where we start to say, wait, so each of these individual stories, these individual lives are interconnected. We're starting to recognize how pressures are connected, just like my toe and my back. Like, oh, this pressure around um, housing or isolation is impacting Ryan over in this part of our community and it's impacting Rose over here too. That's a shared pressure. Um, so we're not only starting to recognize that we have this common experience together, we're naming that shared pressure, uh, but we're um, also as a natural next step, noticing that maybe we might have the power to do something about it together. Uh, as just a really kind of concrete example of this, when my kids started going to school, to elementary school, I felt like I didn't know what I was doing. Like I never, I couldn't track what was going on at school and I couldn't even, I couldn't schedule a play date. Like my daughter wanted to play with her friend at school and I couldn't figure out how to make that happen. <laughs> and I was just like, I am failing at the parenting thing, clearly. Like I am not together enough for this world, I kept out at preschool, like this isn't gonna work out. Um, and then finally, after really, it took like a whole year to be both confident enough and to have like found some connections of other parents to, to talk to, um, and actually honestly, to kind of hunt those down a little bit. <laughs> um, and as soon as I started talking to other parents, I discovered, oh my goodness, we are all experiencing the same thing. Like I'm not in that alone. Every single parent I talked to would be like, I don't know what's going on. How do I even play with Timmy? I can't, how? Do you send a note to school with a five-year-old? That's not gonna work well. Um, so all of us had that same feeling. And as soon as we discovered it, not only were we relieved that it wasn't just us, but we felt empowered to do something about it, right? Once we realized we shared it, like, I think the school needs a directory. I think maybe we need to like arrange some times together so that we all don't stay stuck in that isolation. Um, similarly, I noticed when people would walk through our housing boards that the storyline has that describes the story of housing in our county. Um, I've seen so many people read the, book, the board, just like Story talked about, uh, about being severely rent burdened, which means you're paying more than 50% of your income in rent. Um, and that often results, as they read in the board, in being just at the end of making rent each month and not having enough for savings. Um, and, and they would read that board and be like, oh, wait, I think I, that might be me. And then they would read that they live in a city that is designated collectively as a severely rent burdened city. And then it was like, Oh, A, I didn't know this was a thing. B, this is, this is quite literally, this isn't just a me problem because I'm not working hard enough. This is quite literally our community's problem. And then their whole posture around that problem shifts. Um, so house meetings are a tool to get there. It's one of the tools in our organizer toolbox to be able to bring it out to kind of surface that collective self-interest, those collective pressures of the group. Um, so I'm going to tell you now just really concretely what a house meeting is. So you can kind of get a picture of it in your mind. Um, it's a gathering of five to 15 people that could take place in a house or in someone's home um, or in an apartment, or it could take in a virtual meeting space like this, or it could take place in uh, around tables in a fellowship hall. So I want you right now to picture yourself in one of those spaces um, and start to fill in just for fun who might be around that table. So it might be some other members of your congregation. It might be some friends. It might be some neighbors that you're getting to know through one-to-ones. Um, and uh, you might be focusing as a team around a specific issue. So picture the table you're around you might be focusing on something like housing, right? Um, so you might have a question like, what are the pressures you or your loved ones or neighbors experience around housing and home? That's kind of the core question that you're talking about. Or you may not have honed to that point and you might have kind of a, a broader question you're starting with, which is just, what do we have in common? What are the needs of our community that we share together? So um, that question that you're centering around might be more like, what are the pressures you have experienced or witnessed others around you experiencing in our community? 
What do you care most about when you think about this community? What do you worry about? What are you hopeful about? Um, and I'm gonna tell you a little bit about what facilitation looks like. Go ahead and picture yourself facilitating, just in case that freaks anyone out. <laughs> this would never be something you're doing alone. This would be with a team of people um, at the time you feel ready to do that. Um, but just in order to kind of get a rich picture in your head. So you might, as a facilitator, start by sharing your own story of a pressure um, you or someone you love faces and then inviting others to share. Often a meeting like that can include or start with a one-to-one, -one, which sort of helps get the ball rolling. Um, you as a facilitator, somebody else on your facilitation team would be taking notes and just listening really closely to people's stories and asking op open-ended follow-up questions and sort of encouragements that help make a space for people to share honestly and reflectively. This is a space that really is meant to be personal, not theoretical. So we want to know not necessarily about that thing we heard on the news one time, but the thing that is impacting my life, impacting your life, your neighbor's life, uh, because that's what propels us to care and propels us to move together. So for example, in one house meeting I was in, I noticed one person sharing kind of one of those big intellectual ideas about food insecurity. And then casually mentioning that her brother, a pizza delivery employee, noticed something similar in his work and in his own life. So that might be a point where I would say, oh, can you tell me, I'm curious about that. Can you tell me a little bit more about your brother's experience of that? And in doing that, as she's telling about her brother's experience, she's realizing actually how deeply connected she is to this food insecurity issue. Um, and then as people share, uh, you're reflecting what you are hearing. That's really just simply summarizing and saying, I think I heard you say this. Is this the gist of what you're saying for my notes? Did I get that right? Um, and then you're also noticing patterns and you're asking the whole group to do this too, sort of like, where do you see moments of connection or repetition or resonance? So, um, oh, Sarah, you mentioned not being able to save money for emergencies when your rent was too high. I noticed that same thread with Robert's experience around saving for a house. So then at the end, we collect and summarize and say, okay, what did we hear? What, what are the patterns? Um, and what do we sort of feel energy around in this space? Which is really important piece because just like I did at my kids' school and so many others did around those housing boards, we tend to internalize our stories and play the blame and shame game. And this collecting moment is, is the moment where we begin to notice how our experience is really rooted in community and these shared systemic pressures and um, isn't just a personal story, but a shared one. We have a, a really great example of that. Um, one of our uh, colleagues in Multnomah who has done this house meeting process and Josh Kingsley interviewed her to hear a little more about what that looks like for their congregation. Josh? That's a perfect introduction. I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen and start this video. This is, uh, this is Sarah and Jenny from St. Peter and Paul, which is an Episcopal church on 82nd Avenue in between uh, Burnside and Stark. So in the Montevilla neighborhood. And it is uh, a church like, you know, many of ours, many of the same demographics, many of the same challenges and transitions and changes. And so this is, this is them talking a little bit about um, their first round of house meetings that they did. What was happening that you decided it was time to get people together into a house, into little small group house meetings? Well, I think um, as I started to, you know, I think we'd done a fair amount of one-on-ones. I think um, as everybody knows, one-on-ones are not for everybody. <laughs> um, and we just felt like it was time and the Multnomah County cohort kind of gave us the resources. So I think it was just 
sort of the fullness of time for that stage in the project to have the conversation with more people. Okay. I would say too, I think, um, I mean, it sounds like we knew what we were doing, but we also <laughs> were kind of fumbling around too, I think like probably everyone in this process and, um, or maybe Sarah didn't feel like she was fumbling around, but I did. And um, <laughs> I I think, you know, we, we're we in a, a situation probably like most congregations, but I really had the feeling like we have so many different stakeholder groups and, you know, um, and also we were really wrestling with this question of who we might be serving ultimately. And while we weren't at the phase of deciding that necessarily, I think we felt like input from a variety of people would really help us with that kind of discernment. Okay, yeah, thanks, that's really helpful. I hear that that sense of like kind of having reached saturation with the people that you could have one-to-ones with and also just like kind of a gut feeling that it was just time, time to time to take the next step. Um, when you decided to take that next step, you know, I've heard that these house meetings that you had were bilingual. Is that true? We had one bilingual. House had one meeting. bilingual house meeting. Okay, so you're navigating like a couple of different factors. It's a pandemic. You maybe are dealing with folks that speak a couple of different languages. How did you, how did you decide to do that? Were like were these in person or were they virtual? And how did you make those decisions? They were all virtual. Um, no, that's not yeah. true. <laughs> we yeah. did one in person yeah. at, on a Friday night with the Rahab Sisters people. Mm -hmm. Okay. And um, so we had at the time a bilingual worshiping community that was part of our congregation that was meeting on Thursday nights for a book group on Zoom, there were three ladies. So that was the bilingual one that we had. Um, and that was of necessity. I mean, we weren't, we weren't gonna not talk to those people. So um, we definitely wanted to do that and we needed to be able to do it in Spanish, so. Mm -hmm. Okay, what was, I, um... Jennifer, I'm curious, like, what was it like in the congregation um, when you all were kind of organizing this? Were people, was this new to the congregation? And were they, were they um, interested in trying something new? Or was there, like, mm -hmm. did you have to sell them on it a little bit? Mm -hmm. how, how, how was that? Yeah, I mean, I think we probably had a range of, of, receptivity and curiosity and um, fearfulness <laughs> going on. And I'll just say in general, one of the things I really grew to love and appreciate about the format of the house parties was that approach of having someone share their story, right? And then really inviting people to engage, not from the place of like, well, how could we possibly make a housing project work, but really asking them to reflect on their own personal experiences related to housing and housing insecurity. And it really is this beautiful doorway in, like eventually you can talk about the practicalities and people might wanna do that. And, and that can be really helpful also, but I was, every, house meeting I went to, I was really moved and appreciated the kinds of information that we received from people that I wouldn't necessarily have anticipated. And I really do personally feel like it was because of that approach, which when you're first starting to do it might seem sort of inefficient or something, <laughs> but it's actually so effective or it was in my experience. So. Yeah. Would you say like it was effective in um, like how it was effective in doing what would you say? Well, for one thing, like with our congregation, for example, you know, we're a small congregation. We've struggled for a while. And I think the idea that we're somehow going to create this massive housing project was just inconceivable, really, to a lot of people. And and that house meeting could have completely derailed into people with expressing their fears or um, 
and there's certainly a place for that or getting hung up on the like wanting to know the details that we just didn't know yet right we can't know those things yet and so instead of getting stuck there we had really fruitful discussion about what the needs are in the community what people feel moved by sort of connecting them to a project to the project in a more sort of heart-centered way as opposed to getting waylaid in the little mire of fears and not knowing how something like that would work I don't know if you share that perspective Sarah but yeah yeah no I think that's really true um and the questions that we I mean we started with the kind of basic questions about you know what are you know what's your housing story I mean the same thing that we were doing in one-on-ones you know where do you experience pressure Hmm. um and it, you know we started as jennifer said with somebody who was part of the leadership sharing their story and then depending on the size of the group we would do breakouts or um and people would discover their own sense of pressure or something in their past so um what was exciting to me about the house meetings was the threads that surfaced across mm -hmm. very, very diverse people and different groups that had very different feels was, was just um, this sense of everybody cares about community. Everybody needs a safety net. Mm -hmm. um, and everybody that we talked to was aware of, you know, what the vulnerabilities were of living without either of those things. Mm -hmm. One more question, if you have time. Um, what is happening now? Like, so you've done this set of house meetings and, and it sounds like things have kind of stitched, people's hearts have stitched a little bit closer together. People are more emotionally, more spiritually engaged in seeing what happens. And then like, what would you say is happening now or what has been the result of that? Well, th that's a good question. Um, <laughs> we are trying to have more conversations with people from Rahab Sisters, with people who are on the streets and have more conversations with communities um, that, I mean, the conversation that we had with the Latino folks in our congregation was really powerful. Mm -hmm. And we're having, uh, because of that, we're having a, what may be the first of several listening sessions with a uh, um, community of, um, I can't remember how the community defines itself, but it's Vivo, um, which is an immigrant group mm -hmm. in our area. And they're gonna come over and talk with us about their experiences. And that was really sparked by the little conversation with the three ladies that Jennifer and I were part of, mm -hmm. of what it's like to be an undocumented in this country looking for housing. I mean, it's crazy. Um, so, and that spurred us to apply for this Building Beloved Community Grant so that we could have more conversations with people who don't usually get about their housing stories and their housing needs. So that's kind of, we're kind of in the thick of that right now. Of course, it's going slower than I imagined <laughs> or would like, um, <laughs> but, but we're doing that. And I'm also thinking about, I mean, several of our house meetings that we had a year ago were with housed people from our neighborhood. And I've been thinking a lot about how to sort of circle back to those people and, and kind of go a little bit, go into some of the stuff that we didn't want to go into with the first meeting about, um, you know, how do you feel about a big project like this and what services, you know, what's your experience about what services are most lacking? But we have that relationship with the people that came to the first meeting. I mean, because they came to the first meeting, we feel like they're sort of invested in our project and we can circle back and say, let's have more conversation about this. Absolutely. 
I appreciate that. Yeah, it sounds like uh, it sounds like we started off with a little circle, not a little circle, but a circle of people, and now it's it's growing yes. out, kind of bringing in more people, finding yeah. like the little, yeah. you know, before any big project is done, there's always a thousand like little prep chores mm -hmm. that have to be done to get the you know to get everything ready. It sounds like some right, of those things are right. getting brought in. Okay. I would say, can I say too quickly, just yeah. with our congregation, you know, it's been, we had the house meetings, but it's also been a series of conversations with our vestry, with the congregation. And I, I feel like we've come a really long way in terms of people feeling very invested now and excited and not just terrified. And <laughs> so um, the house parties were really the start of that. And I think they did lay an important foundation for that. Nice. Awesome. Well, thank you both for your time. I really appreciate it. Yeah, thank, thank you. you. Glad to help. Hi, everybody. <laughs> Welcome back. So before we move on to the next thing, any questions? Not that I can necessarily answer them, but because um, you pretty much saw the conversation we had. Jill, what are you thinking? Did, did she say investory? And do you know what that means? Yeah, that's like their, um, if you're Lutheran, that would be your church council. If you're Methodist, ah. that would be your, um, I don't know, it's different when you're Methodist. <laughs> like your, your what? What's that? governance board oh yeah yeah if you have unified board it's your governance board for sure yeah thank you yeah you got it any other questions okay well we're going to practice this a little bit um and we're going to do it with something We're gonna do it with something that is uh, not what we typically talk about. Absolutely, Anna, I just, absolutely, we can make sure we have notes going on. Um, so here's what we're gonna do. Um, as you heard, uh, Sarah Fisher at St. Peter and Paul, they did a bunch of house meetings around housing stories. And that's a, that's a thing, a relatively popular thing. We're gonna do this, we're gonna practice with something different. Just to just to switch it up, because in theory, right? In theory, we could do this about anything, right? Like organizing, you could organize about anything. You could organize to get the dishwasher emptied at your apartment, you know. Um, so we're gonna do this with your musical story, your musical story, and your musical story. I saw a couple of heads just snap up. Um, okay, your musical story is. Uh, just the story of you making sound, essentially. Uh, maybe you played an instrument as a child. Maybe you were in band or choir. Maybe you have gone to a church that sings. Maybe you've never uttered a single pitch out of your body in your entire life. Um, but you've listened to music or your parents listened to music. There's a whole bunch of ways that you could describe a musical story. Does that make sense? We're going to give... Uh, we're going to give a little bit of time, a little bit of reflection time for you to just kind of pull up some of your memories, your musical story. Maybe you're a concert pianist. I, you know, I bet there could be one on this call. I, I don't know. Um, if you, you know, um, and whether you do music or you don't do music, I encourage you to, to spend a few moments to think about why. One way or the other. If you keep doing it, why did you keep going? If you if you did it and stopped, why did you stop? Uh, so it's amazing. <laughs> what was amazing? Yeah, tell me about it. It's, no, it's just amazing how this can happen. We can be in little groups of two or three, then all of a sudden we're all back to group. <laughs> oh, I know. I know. <laughs> and and it, and it, it's almost like talking about music. I mean, where are the, where are the altos and the sopranos? And, <laughs> let's sing a song. On it. <laughs> Where's the director? Yeah. Oh, right, right. Yep. Yep. Anyway. 
Hey, uh, raise your hand if um, if you are like you consider yourself like a singer, a musician. You you partake at least until the pandemic happened. You partook in music of some kind. Okay, cool. It's what almost is, half. Yeah. What do you mean what? by partaken? <laughs> like you've you've made organized noise. Oh, okay. <laughs> um okay um how many of you played an instrument as a child and stopped before adulthood or in adulthood okay okay all right all right how many of you have tried to get one of your children or nieces or nephews or grandchildren to play an instrument okay yeah how was that all right, some people are like, heck yeah, they did it. All right, <laughs> are straight. Um, yeah, um, how many of you, how many people, uh, raise your hand if you just like, you don't have a musical story, you didn't, you don't, you don't sing, don't come from a singing family, you just weren't around that, didn't listen to music much. Okay, yeah, yeah, absolutely, yeah. So I wonder, you know, we kind of have all of these different, these different musical backgrounds and musical experiences on this call. Um, and it makes me wonder um, what there's, there's a, I hear a lot of stories of um, people who have had exposure to music, but um, don't, maybe don't don't do it now. Maybe they've faced, it has faced some pressure. And I would, I would be curious if we were going to dig into it longer, like what are the pressures? So like the pandemic is a pressure on making music, right? But like, what are some of the other pressures that you've faced? Just think about like when you're a teenager and you don't want to take piano lessons anymore. What are the pressures? Like your friends, oh, yeah. uh, <laughs> you know, sports schedules, homework, all of those, all of those kinds of things. Well, I think the, uh, I think one of the very pressure, pressures that you have in terms of the pandemic is that you know we're masks. We can't sing because <laughs> we from singing without the mask can be contagious. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. So we we, yeah. we don't yeah. sing in church. Uh, we we sing in our chorus at Willamette View with masks on. You know, uh, it it isn't the same. Uh, there's there's been a limitation on on. Uh, Music, a lot of uh, you know, a lot of the the, the and choruses and such, you know, are not performing downtown Portland, you know, mm -hmm. for a variety of reasons. I think there are physical restraints. Um, people who were good violinists and then have arthritis in their fingers uh, don't appreciate the sounds that they are making right now. That's one of the reasons I don't play the French horn anymore. It became too <laughs> uncomfortable to, on my hands. Yeah. Well, Harry was reminding me that um, for a while, when I was younger, I played the accordion. I tried. And I discovered not too far into the lessons that I don't really have a sense of rhythm. And it was hard for me to to do both things. Yeah. And so I had to give it up. But I did enjoy it while I was doing or while I was trying to do it. I did like it. Well, I wonder if one of the pressures that people making music faces is uh, the recorded music. Right. 150 years ago, the only music anybody ever heard ever was live. Yeah, that's true. true. And if you, you know, if you ever wanted to hear music in your home, you had to play it yourself. So your piano was your radio. Yeah. And I think being on the, our choir all does all of our rehearsing and our recording on Zoom individually. And at first that was a real challenge, you know, but uh, now it's it's kind of enjoyable to see what the end product's going to look, they're going to sound like when we're all singing individually, you know, and then the choir director puts it together and 
Amazingly, it comes out halfway decent. <laughs> More than halfway, yes. <laughs> I wonder, I want to check in with a couple of the people that maybe felt like you had sort of a, uh, um, if there's folks here that um, weren't able to connect into the musical story at all, how does, what does all of this sound like to you? You know, when you're, you're hearing people talking about singing and playing instruments, is it like, is it like a strange world? What do well, you Josh, do you want, so I, this was a good conversation because I've always been very ashamed to be a musical literate. Like I am not, I don't play music. I never remember to turn any music on. I don't care if there's music on. But through the conversation, I realized I like music when I'm engaged in it myself. So I love dancing. I play the piano. I like singing in choirs. I like it when I'm participating or moving or active with it. But other than that, I have no interest in it, which is, and I have a daughter who loves musical theater and music like makes her happy all the time. I, that's not me. So there's definitely, I was very uh, unhappy that you brought this up as a topic because it's very um, embarrassing <laughs> for me to be such a, you know, they're like, well, don't you play it in the car? And I'm like, never. I never, ever turn music on. Like, I d never. I don't remember what I like. No, nothing. But I do like it when it's, yeah, live. I love concerts. Well, Diane, we're going to invite you yeah. to start singing with the choir now. <laughs> <laughs> I do like, I have sung with choirs and I enjoy it. Yeah, but. Uh, th yeah. Thank you, Diane, because you, you represent a lot of people, you know, <laughs> in society that, that have that particular feeling and attitude. I mean, they will do it with others or see it being performed, but just individually, it isn't of, of uh, that much interest. Yep. Yeah. I think it's got to be a character flaw. I don't know, but. Uh, <laughs> hey, you it's even more impressive. Yeah. You said even... something on to your daughter, so don't say that. Yeah. yeah. She loves it. I, I will only say that um, I do think that I am uh, non-standard, and I do not feel ostracized by it. That's all I've got. Cool. It does my heart good to know that. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah, well, uh, just kind of bringing it in a little bit. So we've just sort of played around with this idea. This is like, an, a, a, again, an experiment of what a house meeting would be like. We did this one around people's musical stories. And, you know, of course, we step into this not, I had no idea what to expect. I figured you might be slightly more musical than the average bear as a collective, just because these are church people. Um, <laughs> however, um, yeah, as you can see, like, you know, different things come up that we don't expect. And it, it does become kind of a curiosity of finding what are, you know, what is happening here? Like what's happening with this group of people about this particular thing? And in asking that, I think also too, just not rushing to craft a narrative and leaving room for like, you know, there are people that could care less <laughs> almost, you know what I mean? Or there are people that it's just like, it's not a part of their life at all. Um, and like, I think Diane, did, you modeled so great, like, you, like everybody brings a cool part of the story, you know, a cool perspective, a, 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 an important perspective to understanding that so if any of you are interested in crafting some kind of musical community organizing action based on this <laughs> let me know uh well, there questions? was certainly was certainly a thread in our group of you know different different ways of experiencing music that brought people joy that that there was a, an association with joy but all of us had different unique experiences with that nice and um, a couple of us had particular experiences around um, traveling or journeying, you know, with with music. And and for my mom, uh, actually, it was a big part of her last two weeks of life, uh, her participation in music. That's interesting. Thank you for sharing that. 
I'm going to pass it on to Jesse now. And no, you're not. No, you're not. I'm no, you're not. not. No. Okay. Nope. You're not going to do it. I'm Whoops. passing it on to Jesse. That's right. I pass it on to you. Yeah. Wrong. <laughs> Wrong baton carrier in the relay, Whoops. Josh. How embarrassing. <laughs> <laughs> um, but that's okay. Um, we're just going to talk about um, some of the resonance that's rising in our cohort here. Like we just got done listening to the re like the resonance and the connectivity in all of our stories around music. Um, and um, I just want to take a minute to acknowledge some of the like really good echoes of stories that are happening in all y'all's organizing work. So this is the time where we talk about celebrating all this, all the stuff that's going on um, and get excited about it. So I need everybody to get their jazz hands out. And when I say <laughs> something really exciting, go ahead and like wave your jazz hands however they go. Josh, those are not jazz hands. Those are dish hands. <laughs> These are jazz hands. Um, all right. So. First off, um, we're hearing some really fun stuff happening at King of Kings. Um, they are kicking butt in their discernment process and learning some cool things um, around what's possible with their land and their building and their stuff and their future. So that's really exciting. Um, Oak Grove UMC had a meeting of their core team with everyone there, which in this day and age with Omicron and everything feels like that is huge. Yes. Um, so that's really exciting. Um, and their their core team is moving and shaking and getting its feet under itself. So that's really exciting. Prince of Life, their congregation had, as a whole, like their whole congregation approved a discernment process where they're going to decide whether to develop by May. Did I say that right? Is that the process? Woo! So like decisions being made, discernment happening, really cool stuff. Um, Bookmark the difference between decision and discernment. Think on that later. Um, St. Paul UMC, um, they their community, uh, Anna just forwarded me like three different emails of all the like community connections and listening that's happening and bubbling up with like just their neighborhood, especially with the local um, school-based organizations um, doing some really great listening there. Um, similarly, a uh, slew of just forwarded notes of a fountain of one-to-ones and research meetings that are happening at Milwaukee Lutheran. Super exciting on the reporting back, which leads me to the question, thumbs up, thumbs sideways, thumbs down. If we had a blank like note-taking reflection form on all y'all's one-to-ones and research meetings that would like help guide your journaling and note-taking process, would that be helpful? Yes. Okay. Story. Make make sure to tick me to like send you the the Jules special form that Jules made for us. Um, because the blank form is actually like really beautiful, and I think offering that forward would be really awesome. Couple of next steps. We did send or are sending an email. Did send are sending an email about a land action that's happening. I've not sent it yet. We'll be sending you an email. <laughs> um. <laughs> Uh, the beauty of being part of a wider ecology of sacred organizers is that when other people have actions um, that they need bodies at, we get invited. So um, the Oregon Synod Lutheran Reparations Team has discerned the need to um, have a sacred action on the land where our Synod office is located, which is at Legacy Emanuel Medical Center. They've been doing some research on that land story um, and are having an event on February 23rd in person masked outside um on on the walk outside um there on vancouver ave um where we're going to listen to some of the generations of displaced um families that were displaced by the by a manual being constructed so that's part of what um that reparations team of leaders is uncovering um so leaders from the Emanuel displaced persons association which is a largely African-American um, community um, are going to be present to share some stories and we'll have sacred action um, and be together in community that night. So we'll send an email out about that with just some reminders of where that story comes from and what we're learning and hearing from that team um, that's part of our ecology. Um, and we would love for folks from the Clackamas County cohort to come and um, show up with your bodies um, to bear witness to that action. Um, and then we can, in the March cohort gathering, maybe have a little section of time to debrief what it felt like to be um, in on an action like that. So that's an opportunity that's coming up. Speaking of the March cohort gathering, that will be on Thursday, March 10th. 
and we are going to have a real live research meeting together as a whole cohort with a nonprofit developer. Like the cohort meeting will be a research meeting. So come ready to learn. Um, also, please note, we realize this, um, when you're sacred organizers, you have to pay attention to the liturgical calendar. So the rhythm of meeting every second Thursday doesn't work in April because that's Maundy Thursday. Um, it's right in the middle of Holy Week. So we're gonna be moving that gathering. So um, pay attention to that, that slight blip in the rhythm. Um, and then the other piece to be aware of is that um, during Lent, uh, the cohort slash storyline community slash our kind of local pastors collab um, is hosting a um, Lenten book study on this book, A Grounded Faith, um, that's written um, by some folks connected to Ecofaith Recovery and um, is um, an echo of a book that Dr. Randy Woodley, a local indigenous author and scholar, wrote called Becoming Rooted. Story's gonna get all of this out on an email, um, but I just wanted to name that the resonance between the work that we're doing, the sacred work of acknowledging land and discerning how to be good stewards of the land that we have in a way that's connected to the past and the present and builds a different kind of future for all of our neighbors, very much connected um, to all of this work that um, is being done in these good books. So um, Story is going to drop that in an email as well, um, but highly recommend um, just keeping your eye out for that. I think that is everything. Did I do it? I didn't leave Jesse any time. <laughs> <laughs> Jill has a question. Who's Who's, who's the research with, just to make sure that there's no cross? Who's the, you said there's a research meeting for everyone. Who's the research with? We're, we're talking to a couple of developers. Right now, it's looking like probably Hacienda develop, development. Oh, I, I understand how you're coming, uh, how you're saying that. Thank you very much. <clears throat> um, okay, uh, Jesse, you have negative two minutes. 30 seconds can we, can we contract to just stay on while we because also the thing that i forgot to say is that if you want to just have a moment to touch base and debrief all of this with your core team tonight is the night that we're going to start doing the thing where we open up breakout rooms for y'all to just touch base and be like what did you guys hear remember we have that meeting at such and such time like um which we would normally do in person after a meeting anyways while we're eating all the leftover pizza but um Maybe someday in the future that could happen. <laughs> um, so stay on for two minutes while Jesse does the eval. And then if you want to, Story's going to guide us into just briefly being able to check in with our core teams if needed. <laughs> 